<laughs> well, welcome everyone. Um, while folks are, are uh, beginning to join, um, we'll wait a few moments so everyone can join us, but um, please feel free to open up the chat and let us know where you're joining us from today. Got folks from California, Englewood, Florida, Buffalo, Darien, Rochester, Brooklyn, Vermont, Colorado, right from Central Park, nice. Well, thanks everyone for joining us on this uh, St. Patrick's Day edition of our webinar series. The webinar series is brought to you by the um, Audubon Connecticut and Audubon New York. Those are uh, state programs of the National Audubon Society. Um, Audubon's mission is to protect birds and their habitats and uh, priority projects areas such as uh, focus on create, creating resilient coastlines and salt marshes, working with uh, forest landowners and managers to improve our woods for wildlife and supporting local activists who are transforming their communities into um, places where birds and people can flourish. Um, this webinar is being recorded and will be uh, quickly available on our Audubon Connecticut and Audubon New York Facebook pages shortly after the after the completion. Um, you can ask questions at any time in the chat um, and we will have a question and answer period at the end of the presentation. Um, now I'd like to pass the mic to Deb Rivel. Um, Deb is a board member of Audubon New York and the founder of Wild, Wild Sight Productions and wildtones.com and co-author of Bird Watching in New York City and on Long Island. And Deb will introduce our speaker. Deb? Well, thank you, Rich. It's a real honor for me to introduce our presenter today, Ken Kaufman. Ken burst onto the birding scene as a teenager in the 1970s, hitchhiking all over North America in pursuit of birds, an adventure later chronicled in his cult classic book, Kingbird Highway. After several years as a professional tour leader, taking groups to all seven continents, he transitioned to a career as a writer, editor, and illustrator. Most of his energy currently goes into book projects and painting bird portraits. He's written more than a dozen books. His latest is A Season on the Wind, Inside the World of Spring Migration, and that was published in 2019. Ken is a field editor for Audubon, a fellow of the American Ornithological Society, and the only person to have received the American Birding Association's Lifetime Achievement Award twice. Today, Ken will be speaking to us about the pattern of bird migration, which is very timely as spring migration is really beginning to ramp up around us. Migratory birds in North America travel in every conceivable direction, and some migration is in progress every day of the year. This program will explore some of the surprising routes traveled by migrating birds. Ken will also describe the strategies of timing, direction, and habitat choice that enhance the survival of various species. And with that, I thank you for joining our webinar and hand things over to our presenter, Ken Kaufman. Ken? Well, thank you, Deb. I'm, uh, I'm honored to be here. Really appreciate uh, um, people coming to listen to me talk about patterns of bird migration. It, I love this time of year, sort of when winter is, is giving way to spring. Um, we, uh, I live in Northern Ohio and we get, we get a certain amount of weather uh, winter weather over here. And, um, we're sort of at the southern edge of the, the usual winter range for snowy owls. Things change really rapidly in early spring. Uh, just a month ago, uh, we had a foot and a half of snow on the ground. We had snow buntings uh, out in the driveway. But now things are, um, things are changing really rapidly. The killdeers came back. They're all over the place now calling. Um, in another few weeks, we'll start to have this big influx of, um, of yellow rump warblers coming in to sort of as the vanguard uh, for all the rest of the warblers that will show up later. And the, the whole concept of, of bird migration is just, it's been fascinating to me ever since I was a little kid. And um, I finally got around to actually writing a book about it, that um, A Season on the Wind was published uh, just a couple of years ago. And it's, um, I, can't, uh, I can't summarize the whole thing here. So I'm gonna go a different direction and talk about the, uh, the geographic patterns of bird migration, where and when these birds are traveling. Um, 
across North America and beyond. Now, one of the things about uh, bird migration is that it's a huge phenomenon. It's really a huge, massive worldwide phenomenon involving billions of birds, uh, some of them traveling thousands of miles, but it's a phenomenon that is mostly invisible. Mostly you can't see it. And I, you know, this gives me some trouble when I'm dealing with editors, like at publishers and magazines. If you're doing a piece about migration, they want to show flocks of birds going somewhere. So, you know, I do the same thing. I, <laughs> this, uh, I, I use this picture in migration talks all the time, but this was a flock of brant on the coast of California in early January. They weren't migrating any place. They were just flying across the bay. But, you know, editors, they always want to have a picture of a flock of birds in flight. So there'll be a suggestion of, of something like this. Okay, okay, here we are, migration. Here's a bunch of birds going someplace. But, you know, these are, um, these are actually European starlings. They're, they're not native in North America. They're not really migratory. Um, so I, I constantly have to sort of bring it back to say, you know, really migration is a wonderful thing, but it's often invisible. And that's part of what makes it so fascinating uh, and why there's been so much mystery about it uh, over the years. Now, an awareness of migration in a general way goes back a long time. Um, uh, at least 2,600 years ago, the prophet Jeremiah uh, in the Middle East wrote about how birds like the stork and the crane and the turtle dove observe the time of their coming. Uh, Jeremiah, he was in the Middle East. It's a major bottleneck for birds that are migrating between Europe and Asia and wintering grounds in Africa. So, you know, he noticed the migrants um, and, and mentioned it. Uh, and it's, so it's, it's present in some of the oldest literature in the world. A couple of centuries later, um, Aristotle in Greece was aware of the migrations of cranes. I mean, cranes are big, noisy birds. So, you know, he observed them going over in spring and fall. And uh, he had heard that they were down in Egypt in the winter and up north of the Black Sea in summer. So he figured out they were going north and south. But for most kinds of birds, the awareness of migration took a lot longer um, to develop. So you have things like uh, this bird called the Connecticut Warbler. <laughs> this is Audubon's painting of it from the late uh, 1820s. So I think he was aware of the fact that it, you know, it didn't spend its whole life in Connecticut. Uh, but, <laughs> they, they, he was sort of vague on the details of that. Uh, we have this sort of thing with the names of a lot of birds. The magnolia warbler, for example, uh, has no real connection to magnolia trees. So the first ones that any scientist noticed you know, happened to be in a magnolia tree somewhere in the south in migration, but you know, that's as far as the connection goes. Uh, the Nashville warbler, uh, as it happened, Alexander Wilson ran into his first ones near Nashville in Tennessee. And, you know, the bird, it doesn't spend the summer there. It doesn't spend the winter there. It doesn't like country music. You know, it really doesn't have any connection at all uh, to Nashville. But we, you know, we have these names because the understanding of migration was so fragmentary just a couple of hundred years ago. Now, now we have... You know, we have birders everywhere at all times of year, so there's a better concept of the fact that birds are in fact migrating, but the details are still um, still being worked out. There's, um, there's sort of a popular idea of bird migration that birds fly straight north in spring and then turn around and fly straight south in fall. And in fact, there are, there are hardly any North American birds that follow a pattern as simple as that. The, the reality is actually uh, much more complicated. And when I say that, I'm, I'm leaving out the really nomadic birds. I mean, there's some birds that, you know, they never follow any kind of rules. Something like the white-winged crossbill, for example, they, they may move at any time of year. They may nest at almost any time of year. They're feeding on spruce cones, so they will stop and nest. They'll build a nest, raise young. When they come to a place where there's a good crop of spruce cones, and then they'll move on, mostly moving east and west rather than north and south. And so you have, may have individual white wing crossbills that are in eastern Canada one year and in Alaska the next year. Just, so they, you know, forget about those. But even with birds that are really 
migratory with regular summer and winter ranges, um, they don't really follow this straight north, straight south kind of pattern. One interesting example involves uh, Rufus Hummingbird. And on this map, uh, if you can see my pointer here, the, the green area is the breeding range, the blue is the wintering range. The brown stuff here that looks like someone spilled coffee on the map, uh, that's just to, to indicate where the, the general mountain ranges are. But so uh, Rufus hummingbirds are breeding up here in Northwestern US, uh, Western Canada, Southern Alaska, wintering down in Southern Mexico. Now the, uh, the timing of their migration, their, their spring migration begins uh, in January, um, and they start moving northwest along the coast uh, from this wintering range. So at, at a time that we would consider it to be winter, they're moving toward the northwest and then moving up the coast during February. Some of the northernmost parts of their uh, breeding range they won't get to until later in the spring. But they're moving through the deserts at a time of year when there are flowers out there uh, in the desert, so it's, it's possible for them to uh, uh, to find food as they're traveling. Now, their fall migration begins in June. Um, what, you know, we would think of June as being summer, but the adult males are leaving the breeding grounds by the middle of June and starting toward the southeast. And instead of going through the desert, they're going back through the mountains. And at that time of year, the mountain meadows are, are full of flowers. So at both seasons, uh, they're taking advantage of the, uh, the resources and having food available. So they're going northwest through the desert at a time of year when the deserts are relatively green and have lots of flowers. They're going southeast through the mountains when there are lots of flowers blooming there at high elevations. And so it's really closely timed for this change in season. Um, and it makes a lot more sense than if they just tried to go uh, straight north and south. Now every year, um, uh, some Rufus hummingbirds in late summer and fall will go way off to the east. Uh, they'll move um, far east of their normal migration route. And now they've actually developed new wintering areas in the southeastern United States. It's far from the traditional wintering grounds in Mexico, but we know from banding results that some of these birds are surviving quite well they're wintering regularly in the Southeast, you know, somewhere between Louisiana, Florida, the Carolinas. They're winter, wintering over there, going back to breeding grounds, um, somewhere, you know, the Northwest, and then going back to the Southeast for the winter. So they've actually changed their overall distribution just uh, within living memory. Now this kind of uh, East and West migration isn't just a thing that happens with uh, hummingbirds. Uh, tundra swan is another example. Um, I live in, uh, in northern Ohio, and we get uh, good numbers of tundra swans going through here. In fact, um, the last couple of weeks uh, was really a good time for them. Late February, uh, there were thousands of them around. Um, so the, the red star here is northern Ohio, where I live. A lot of the tundra swans are wintering over around Chesapeake Bay or down into the eastern part of the Carolinas. So in spring, when it's time for them to migrate, uh, they're not going straight north. They're going toward the west northwest. So they'll come, they'll arrive here from the southeast, spend a little while, then they take off and they go on toward the northwest. And a lot of these tundra swans that have wintered on the Atlantic coast will wind up in western Canada or even in Alaska for the summer. So they're going straight across the continent. And you get the similar things with some kinds of shorebirds. Um, where I am, um, we see willets in spring, but they're not coming from the south. Uh, they're coming from the east. Uh, if you're over around uh, the New York, Connecticut area, over on the Atlantic coast, you have willets in summer. Those are the eastern subspecies. They spend the winter in South America. You have willets showing up in uh, late summer and fall, and some of them will spend uh, the winter along the Atlantic coast, they're mostly just a little south of you. But those are the Western birds. They're migrating east and west across the continent. So, you know, they don't follow <laughs> the rules. They don't follow the maps. That's part of what makes this all even more interesting. 
Now, the, the concept of flyways is something that's really well known. Uh, this is a, a generalized map uh, based on the work of Frederick Lincoln from the 1920s and 1930s. Uh, Frederick Lincoln was the first uh, head of the US bird banding lab. And when he was first in charge of it, uh, he pushed this big initiative to have lots of ducks banded because he knew they would get uh, returns on those bands. Um, the, the duck hunters would you know, faithfully send back the bands on any ducks that they, that they shot. So they could very quickly get lots of returns, get lots of information. So based on the, uh, the geography of the band returns and all these banded ducks, uh, Frederick Lincoln worked out the idea of there being four uh, basic flyways uh, for these, uh, these migratory waterfowl. Uh, the Atlantic, the Mississippi, the Central, and the Pacific flyways. And if you look at these little colorful ducks here, the red and green and blue and black ones, you'll see a lot of overlap uh, in where they go. And that's reality because they do, they do cross over. And so you do have um, lots of overlap between them. And when you come right down to it, the whole concept of, um, of flyaways doesn't work as well for a lot of other birds, but it's extremely useful for, as an organizing principle, uh, for things like, like waterfowl management and also for a conservation group. Uh, National Audubon has, uh, they're organized uh, by flyaways now. Uh, the things we do, um, you've got regular uh, communication among states that are within a flyway. And it makes a lot of sense because, you know, if you're, um, you know, if you're in New York, um, You've got more in common in terms of migratory birds with the states directly north and south of you uh, than you do with, you know, states that would be similar in alphabetical order like Nebraska or New Mexico. So uh, we use this system of flyways, but to, to make it really useful, it's important to realize that a lot of the birds are not, um, not following this. And in particular, for most kinds of birds, there are not gaps between these, uh, these flyaways. They're not like highways in the sky with empty space in between. The birds are spread out on a broad front and go moving across the continent like this, uh, really flying over every square mile. So that's my, I'm a big fan of flyaways, but I also have to point out that um, the birds don't recognize them as clearly as we do. Uh, one thing that's really interesting, um, if you start looking at patterns of migration for a lot of birds, and if you look at land birds, you know, the songbirds and so on, there's a real concentration of them in the eastern half of the lower 48 states. There, this, uh, the green area on this map represents what we could call like a generalized breeding range for the category of neotropical migrants. Uh, they, they're all the way west into central Alaska. They're all the way across Canada. They extend southward in the Appalachians here. Um, a high percentage of these birds migrate north and south through the eastern half of the continent. So you have huge numbers of migratory birds that nest in central Alaska, the land birds now, that will move way to the east in fall before they move south. So overall, there are much higher numbers of migratory birds passing through the eastern states. Um, that's not to say that the western states are unimportant. Uh, there are major, major concentration points in the west as well. And in fact, Audubon um, has recently done some really groundbreaking research there that uh, um, they found that there are real concentration points uh, in the central valleys of California uh, and around the Colorado River Delta here in northwestern Mexico that are extremely important to the survival of a lot of bird species. And uh, there's actually, there, there was a good story about that on the uh, Audubon website not long ago. But, you know, fascinating stuff. But overall, in general, if you were to pick a random square mile uh, in the lower 48, there would be more migratory birds going over it in the east uh, than in the west. And uh, something that's related to this is that um, um, where you have uh, species pairs with one in the west and one in the east, the eastern birds tend to migrate farther. Uh, looking here at uh, western tanager and scarlet tanager, 
Um, I've mapped out the, uh, the general breeding ranges of them. Um, and if you look at, um, look at their wintering ranges, scarlet tanagers mostly go to South America. Western tanagers are mostly in Mexico and Northern Central America. So they're, uh, they're not going nearly as far. Uh, you get a similar pattern uh, if you looked at uh, black-headed grosbeak and rose-breasted grosbeak, uh, black-headed grosbeak doesn't get much farther south than uh, than southern Mexico, whereas rose-breasted grosbeak, a lot of those are well down into South America in the winter. Um, and likewise, you get the, a similar pattern with these two orioles, uh, Bullock's oriole, Baltimore oriole, are close relatives, but uh, Bullock's oriole is mostly in Mexico and um, barely into Guatemala in the winter, while Baltimore Orioles get down to South America in good numbers. So, so in general, um, you have in the East, you, see, you have more individual migratory birds going through, and a lot of them are migrating farther. Um, just an interesting pattern. You know, there are more bird species in the West than there are in the East. So where is the birding better? You know, that's, that's an ongoing debate. Um, one thing that happens is that um, many of the birds that we think of as Eastern are actually both Eastern and Northern. Um, looking at this, this map for rose-breasted grosbeak, it's an Eastern bird, but it's, uh, its breeding range extends over to the base of the Rockies here uh, in Alberta, even uh, Northeastern British Columbia. And so, um, if some of the, if they go a little bit off course in fall, they can show up um, anywhere in the West. And so as a result, for a lot of uh, what we consider to be the Eastern birds, they show up in the West um, as vagrants uh, pretty often. So for, um, if, you're, if you're looking for vagrants, uh, vagrant hunting can be a lot more productive in the West. Uh, when I lived out in Arizona, you know, we, we expected to see some black and white warblers every year, even though it's an Eastern bird. Now that I'm living in Ohio, I've seen a couple of black-throated gray warblers here, but it's, it's really a big deal when you find one. So uh, just another interesting thing that comes about because of these uh, migration patterns. Um, these uh, these east-west uh, shifts um, can be even more obvious when you're looking at birds that are truly long-distance migrants. Uh, like some of the shorebirds, uh, white rum sandpiper is a good example, uh, breeding in the high Arctic of Canada and Alaska, wintering all the way to the southern tip of South America. Looking at some of these birds, uh, buff-breasted sandpiper, this is a long distance migrant. Uh, the green up here is to represent its uh, breeding range. Uh, northern slope, of, it's the north slope of Alaska and mostly the uh, Canadian high Arctic winters in southern South America on the grasslands here in Argentina and nearby countries. And if you look at their, their spring migration, um, it follows a fairly narrow corridor. A lot of this here in South America is speculative. Um, uh, some friends of mine just recently saw buff-breasted sandpipers in eastern Colombia around here, and there actually aren't that many records of them there, but that's um, probably mostly because there aren't observers in the right habitat at the right season. Um, they pretty much have to be flying over that area because they're not any place else. But they get up here to North America, they're concentrated in Eastern Mexico, and then coming up through the Central Great Plains uh, before spreading out to these Arctic um, uh, breeding grounds. Now in fall, some of them come back down the same way, and again, you see both breasted sandpipers coming through the, uh, the Great Plains. But then there are others that go way to the east. Uh, they come through the, uh, the Great Lakes, through the Atlantic coast, and then make a long overwater flight uh, to South America. And so it's um, uh, these, these birds, um, I don't think anyone has calculated the exact time that they would be in the air uh, flying for it from uh, say from Canada to South America, but some of them may do that as a nonstop trip. Uh, Hudsonian godwit is another species uh, that breeds at scattered points in the Arctic and winters in Southern South America. Um, and their fall migration, uh, it involves a really strong eastward shift. Um, 
the vast majority of the Hudsonian godwits uh, migrate out over the open waters of the Atlantic on their way to uh, South America. And some of them probably, after staging in James Bay, they probably make just a nonstop trip from there. So the spring migration is also a, a fairly restricted corridor, but it's farther west. I and mean, they come up uh, through the interior, through the Great Plains. Um, really, uh, they're much more unusual uh, away from the Great Plains uh, in spring than they are in fall. I just love these patterns. Uh, now, Franklin's gull, most gulls, um, if you start looking at them on the range maps, most gulls are not long distance migrants. Um, you know, you get uh, you get some Arctic species of gulls, make it all the way down to, you know, the the lower 48 states. Um, but uh, in general, if if they're a real high Arctic breeder like Glaucus gull or Iceland gull, you're sort of looking at the southern edge of their winter range if you're in New York. Um, Franklin's gull, though, that's one that's um, it's a long distance migrant, um, and it's, it's interesting that it breeds mainly in, in, in the interior. It's mostly the southern uh, part of the Canadian prairie provinces. It's up in the Dakotas and scattered spots in the west. Uh, you would think that this would be a gull that wouldn't be likely to show up on other continents, but it does. And that's uh, because of its migratory route. Uh, here's um, It's got one of the longest mig migrations of any of the gulls. Um, this, this orange arrow here indicates where they're migrating. Um, they come down through the Great Plains and fall down the east coast of Mexico. They cross the isthmus of Tehuantepec, continue down along the west coast of Central America to wintering grounds uh, all along the west coast of South America. So it's a prairie bird in the summer. It's a coastal bird in winter and with this long migration, they do go off course. They've been found uh, in Europe, in Africa, in Australia, um, just uh, an amazing uh, globe trotter. Uh, the only gull that really migrates farther is the, uh, the Sabine's gull, uh, which is uh, a very much a, a seabird for most of the year. So I just love these patterns. <laughs> That's. Uh, uh, you can, uh, if you go to, uh, there are places on the Northern Plains, like in the Dakotas, where you can see thousands of Franklin's gulls in summer up over the marshes. And then uh, if you go to Lima, Peru, in winter, in winter, there are these huge flocks of Franklin's gulls right along the waterfront, down there on the docks with things like Inca terns and uh, red-legged cormorants and uh, Peruvian boobies and so on. Here are these huge flocks of Franklin's gulls on, on their wintering grounds. And it, I, I, love, um, I love seeing them in these different settings. Now, uh, there are a lot of birds uh, that breed in the far north and winter in the far south. And uh, you know, I mentioned, for example, uh, some of the shorebirds, the buff-breasted sandpiper, Hudsonian godwit, uh, the Franklin's gulls, uh, they breed in the northern hemisphere, winter in the southern hemisphere. There aren't very many land birds that go the opposite direction. You know, if you were at, uh, you know, take the latitude of, of New York and go to that uh, latitude, uh, that number of south degrees in South America, you would see migrants there that breed in North America. Uh, you would see things like, like bobolinks. Um, you would see uh, buff-breasted sandpipers. Uh, but uh, if you're in New York, you're not seeing migratory breed, birds that breed in South America until you go offshore, because there are a lot of seabirds that breed far south of the equator and spend their winters on the northern oceans. Uh, great Shearwater is one example. Wilson Storm Petrel is a great example. Um, all of their breeding areas are around the southernmost continents, uh, around the southernmost tip of South America, around the Antarctic. But if you go offshore in the Atlantic coast, uh, uh, anywhere along the Atlantic coast of the US, Wilson storm petrel is one of the most common birds in summer. And they're all thousands and thousands of miles from the areas where they nest. So that's, um, that's the cultural exchange we've got. We get seabirds from the far Southern latitudes 
uh, coming to visit us uh, when it's our summertime. Now, I want to talk about spring raptor migration a bit. I, <laughs> there's so many great examples of migration that I can't resist talking about a lot of them. Um, only a few species of birds of prey in the Americas are really long distance migrants, but they do account for large counts of individual hawks at a few points in Central America, north to Texas, but north of there, they pretty much spread out so much that we don't really see large concentrations in spring, uh, except around the Great Lakes, because most of these birds don't like to cross open water. So when they get to the uh, south side of one of the Great Lakes, they'll turn and follow it around. So you get birds going around Lake Erie, uh, you get birds going around Lake Ontario, and you'll see big concentrations at places like Derby Hill in upstate New York. You'll see concentrations at Whitefish Point in Michigan. Um, and so um, it's the, they're only really concentrated where they're forced to be. We see more, uh, more concentrations in fall uh, when the, uh, the raptor population is swelled by all the young birds that have hatched during the summer. So there are some that are coming down along the Atlantic coast. Well, there are some that come down the eastern ridges. They take advantage of the updrafts rising up. Uh, when wind hits some of these ridges, uh, it forms updrafts, and the birds can just glide along there for miles without having to uh, flap their wings, so they're having to burn up any energy. Uh, you get big concentrations on the north side of the, the Great Lakes in fall, uh, coming through the Detroit area. Uh, coming through uh, Hawk Ridge at Duluth, Minnesota. Just big numbers that have come around Lake Superior and then turn the corner and head south, and then they disperse again. Um, out west, there are lots of different concentration points for hawks uh, all along these ridges, but there's so many different ridges that they can follow that you don't get big concentrations of hawks there uh, like you do in the east. So. Um, all across the Great Basin, all along the Rockies, you get small concentration sites of migrating hawks. But then you get down into Mexico and things really become concentrated. Birds from across most of the continent move into the eastern coastal plain of Mexico in a very concentrated way. And if you look at uh, this is the, uh, the Mexican state of Veracruz. And there's a point here where the mountains come down almost to the coast. And so these birds that have been moving south along the coastal plain, they're moved into this bottleneck between the ocean and the mountains. And you get these, these vast concentrations of them. Uh, it's called the river of raptors. And being there in early October is one of the most amazing things you can imagine. Uh, when I was the, the biggest day that I've seen there was a day when the uh, the official counters from Pro Natura said that the total count was 400,000 birds of prey. But you know, for all I could tell, it could have been a million. Just um, it's it's staggering, and it's just because they don't want to fly over water, so they're going around taking the long way around. You know, if you look at, uh, if you compare North America uh, to Europe, compare the, compare the Americas to uh, Europe and Africa, migratory birds in both areas have bodies of water they have to deal with. Um, here in the Americas, they have to go around the Gulf of Mexico and the Caribbean. In the old world, they have to go around or across the Mediterranean. And that's coupled with the fact that the Sahara Desert is just to the south of it. So. Um, Here's uh, looking at a, a raptor, a migratory raptor from the old world. The European honey buzzard has several different migratory routes, and they're set up so that the bird can avoid the you know, long crossings of open water. Something like that happens with smaller birds, too. The willow warbler is a long distance migrant. Uh, the green, uh, again, up here is the breeding range, the blue is the winter range, and they, um, they have to deal with. Um, with the Mediterranean. Uh, so a lot of, most of them uh, perhaps go around it, but we know now that uh, there are also some that go straight across, that go right across the middle of the Mediterranean 
and then across the Sahara Desert. And for a long time, it was assumed that they made just a long stop flight um, uh, across the desert. But there are radar studies now that suggest that actually a lot of these birds are coming down. There must be like a little oasis situations there where these birds are able to stop. Um, just, just seeing all these, these strategies that birds have. Again, jumping to a different uh, group of birds, uh, I want to talk about the brant. If you're in uh, the New York, Connecticut area, you know that the brant come to visit there in winter. They winter all along the coast. Um, it's very much a saltwater bird. It's rare to see it um, on freshwater habitats. But looking at the different populations, there are some amazing things they do in terms of their migration. Uh, the black brant is the Western form, breeds in uh, Western Canada and Alaska. This red star here indicates Eisenbeck Lagoon in southwestern Alaska, and it's a major staging area for migrating black brant. Now in spring, a lot of these black brant are wintering in western Mexico, down in Baja, and they're, um, they're coming north along the coast uh, to Eisenbeck Lagoon, um, and it may uh, they may be moving north gradually for something like four months and then stop over for a week or two at Eisenbeck Lagoon. Uh, in fall, it's very different. They may stage for up to nine weeks at Eisenbeck. And then when they finally leave, uh, many of them will fly straight to Western Mexico in a continuous flight for three or four days over the open water. And birds from different populations are actually going to different wintering areas. So some of these, uh, the birds from over here, um, the, the northern Canadian mainland, they stage at Eisenbeck and then fly nonstop to Baja. Birds, there's, there's a gray-bellied brant population here from farther north. Again, they stage in this area, but they winter largely around Puget Sound and Washington State. Uh, so it's very different. And then you go to the eastern brant populations. Uh, we looked at the ones out west. They were going the long way around to go around Alaska. These eastern birds, um, the majority of them go straight overland. They'll stage in southern James Bay, then make a nonstop flight to uh, Jamaica Bay, to the New York area uh, for the winter range. Smaller numbers apparently go from Ungava Bay right across the Angava Peninsula to the lower St. Lawrence River. And then you have another population in the Eastern Canadian High Arctic that actually go east. Uh, they migrate across Greenland, across Iceland, across the North Atlantic, the winter in Northwestern Europe, uh, mostly in Ireland. And then on top of all that, uh, the, the wintering branch in Western Mexico are not just from Canada and Alaska. There are also birds from Russia there. So they've come from Siberia to Eisenbeck and then south to, to Mexico. So there's all this interchange among these different continents with these migratory birds. And it's not just big birds like Brant. Uh, northern wheat ears, there are northern wheat ears that breed in northeastern Canada that spend the winter in Western Africa. Um, they, uh, some of them, um, may fly uh, just across to Northwestern Europe and then south. Others may go straight nonstop to West Africa in a nonstop flight. You also had Northern wheat ears that breed all the way across Northern Europe and Asia. They are also wintering in Africa all the way across the continent here. And you can see that some of these birds are making a very long distance flight to get there. But then in addition, you've got wheat ears that nest in Canada, you know, up in Western Canada and Alaska, that are also migrating to spend the winter in Africa. So they're going, uh, it's like at least halfway around the earth to get there. So this little bird, this little Northern wheat ear, which doesn't look all that impressive, you have these birds coming from all across the Northern hemisphere, coming across the North Atlantic, coming all the way across Asia to wintering grounds in Africa. It's just the connections, the connections among these birds are just extraordinary. Um, you know, if we, if we had more time, I could go on and on with shorebirds that migrate from Alaska to New Zealand or Australia. Um, 
shorebirds that nest in Alaska and migrate down the coast of China. Um, there are just so many examples, but I'm going to bring it back and just uh, talk about warblers, about warbler migration east of the Rockies, and uh, specifically three main arrival routes for these birds uh, in the springtime. And we're all looking forward to the warbler migration now. Um, these birds, uh, there are three basic routes that they follow to deal with the challenge of the Gulf of Mexico. So there's some that come around the Gulf. Um, they'll come, it includes birds that actually winter in South America, like Canada warblers. Canada warblers are almost all uh, in South America in the winter, and they take the long way around here. They come up through Central America, through Mexico, and then spread out from there. Um, they're among the later migrants to arrive, and it could be partly because they're taking this roundabout route. Wilson's warbler is another bird that does that. They winter mostly in Mexico, so it makes sense for them to go around the Gulf of Mexico and, instead of flying across the water. Then there's this major route that crosses the Gulf. Birds taking off from the Yucatan Peninsula, flying straight north across the Gulf of Mexico to the Gulf Coast. Uh, this flight for a small brood takes something like 18 hours. So they're taking off just after it gets dark, flying straight north, arriving the middle of the day the next day. And if the weather's good, they'll go a fair distance inland before they come down. Magnolia warbler is an example of a bird that follows that route. Uh, chestnut sided warbler is another. Blackburnian warbler is another, coming from wintering grounds in South America and then spreading out um, across the, the northern forest after it crosses the Gulf of Mexico. And then there's the other route that comes up through Florida. And this is especially uh, useful for birds that winter mostly in the Caribbean, like the black-throated blue warbler. Black-throated blues are mostly out here in the greater Antilles in winter. So it makes sense for them to come up through, uh, through Florida and then spread out from there. Black pole warbler is another good example. Black poles winter in South America. They come up through the Caribbean, through Florida, and then spread out uh, from there. So their their spring migration. Some of them are going from Brazil to Alaska, and it's really an impressive thing. But what they do in fall is uh, is even more impressive. Here's sort of a map of the the spring migration route for black pole warbler, coming from South America through the Caribbean through Florida spreading out to this, this breeding range across Canada and Alaska. Now in fall, the fall plumage doesn't look quite as impressive, but they do some amazing things at this time of year. Uh, the fall migration, um, most black pole warblers start off uh, by moving strongly east, especially if they're from Western Canada and Alaska. They move strongly east across uh, southern Canada, across the northeastern states. Sometimes we have huge numbers of them uh, in northern Ohio along the edge of Lake Erie, um, but they're not moving south. They're moving toward the east-southeast. And most of that population is believed to make a long flight over the open ocean. They're not going down through Florida. They're going out over the water and flying south. Some of them will come down in islands in the Caribbean. Some apparently go nonstop all the way to South America. And it's a flight that can take up to 80 hours. I mean, think about that. Think about being a small bird weighing like an ounce or so. If you're a black pole warbler, totally fattened up for migration, you double your weight to something like an ounce. And then you fly for 80 hours across habitat that looks like this, you know, and you can't swim. <laughs> There's no place to land out there. So you just keep going. It's the most extraordinary thing. And you know, when I think about the fact that birds do that, um, it fills me with a sense of not just scientific amazement, but also a sense of wonder that we're sharing the planet with these amazing creatures that do things that we can't follow, um, even in our imaginations. And you know, when we when we look at these migratory birds. Um, they perform these, these feats of navigation and endurance and survival. And, you know, we're talking about these, these patterns of migration. We haven't even touched on how they navigate. 
you know, that's a topic for a completely different talk. The fact that a bird, you know, something like a black pole warbler can leave a tree in central Alaska in early fall, migrate to South America, the following spring it can find its way back to the very same tree that it left the previous fall. Um, you know, just the, <laughs> it's astounding. There's no way to describe it, but it's something that deserves our respect. I think it deserves our, our reverent attention when we see the things that these birds do. National Audubon does so many important things. Uh, I'm, I'm really, I joined the National Audubon Society when I was nine years old, and I'm proud you know, to have been a member ever since. Um, they work on so many important things, but to me, one of the most important things they have going now is this Migratory Bird Initiative. There's wonderful information um, on the Audubon website already about this, uh, this program, and they're adding more all the time. So I, I really encourage you to bookmark that and, and pay attention. They've got, to, they're gonna have some really great content coming out this summer, I believe, based on the latest research. So um, when I think about that, I think about these birds, the amazing things that they do, the amazing people who are working to, so, to promote the survival of these migratory birds and to promote the sustenance of these systems of migration that uh, provide us with, with so much inspiration. I mean, sure, birds are, they have economic importance. They're important to maintaining the ecosystem and so on. And I think, you know, we, we need to protect bird populations just for those ecosystem services, as they're called. But I think we also need to preserve them for the inspiration that they give us. So um, I appreciate your attention as I have just romped rapidly through all these migratory patterns. And um, so I, I thank you. I'll, I'll stop at this point and I'd be glad to answer any questions. Well, thanks, Ken. That was fascinating. Um, I love that very much. And, and, and yes, we do. We got plenty of questions already during your presentation. And if anyone has any others, um, we'll get to as many as we can in the next 15 minutes or so. So please just type those in the chat. Um, I have a couple of folks uh, with me today to help me facilitate the question and answers. Um, we have uh, Ken Elkins. That's, he's Audubon's program manager, of community conservation. You may recognize him from previous webinars. He's He's a, he's a regular, he's like a blue jay at a bird feeder. He's, he's great help. And uh, we also have Melanie Smith, uh, program director from Audubon's um, Migratory Bird Initiative that Ken just mentioned. Um, and Melanie, before we start pelting Ken with questions, um, I got a question for you. Um, you're joining us from tropical Alaska. What, uh, what do you see up there in Alaska that, um, you know, might be, um, uh, you know, uh, different, um, a different mi mi migration um, thing that, we, that we'd see down here in lower latitudes. Yeah, you know, it is a little different being this far north in Alaska. Um, this is a really a gathering destination for migratory birds. And, we, you know, in the lower 48 states, you're commonly thinking about these four flyways that are somewhat distinct, although, you know, Ken's description really helped, um, um, you know, with that, that they're not exactly distinct, but we do still think about for these four flyways, the Atlantic, the Mississippi, the Central, and the Pacific. And those are all merging. And, and the maps you showed, Ken, are so wonderful for visualizing this, how they're all merging up here in Alaska, where the birds come, um, they come together, and they're mating and they're breeding, and then they disperse back down those flyaways, sometimes taking the same route, sometimes taking a different route than they came. And I think it's something that maybe people don't think about quite as much is the fifth flyway that comes to Alaska. We are really close, you know, Alaska is only a few miles away from Russia at its closest point. So that, that landscape um, it's usually shown all the way around the other side of the world. Well, to us, it's right next door. And so our birds are, they're leaving and flying down the East Asian, Australasian flyway too, and going to Eastern Russia, Japan, Southeast Asia, Australia. And, and with all five of those flyways coming together up here, 
we have birds from at least six continents and we're not positive, but possibly the Arctic turn goes straight from Alaska to Antarctica as well. So um, it's really this amazing gathering place and, and an, a really wonderful place to be a birder. So, um, and so yeah, thank you for that introduction. And so I'm going to send a question over to Ken. Uh, you know, one thing that came up is, could you tell us a little bit more why do raptors avoid water so strongly while these little, you know, one ounce songbirds are just heading right, right in over the ocean and, and spending a few days flying over? Yeah, that's an interesting point. Something I might ask for, should I stop my screen share? Will that be a better view for everyone? Yeah, that's probably great. So they can see you answer a little better. Thank you. Yeah, okay, great. Yeah, um, well, I, um, I, again, trying to cover a lot of a lot of topic in a short time. Um, not all the raptors avoid crossing water. Ospreys regularly migrate down through southern Florida and across through the Caribbean to South America, and peregrines and some of the, some of their falcons will migrate over water. But for a lot of these birds, um, it's not that easy mm -hmm. for them to uh, to feed as they're migrating. Uh, you think about. Um, you know, if a bunch of warblers land in a woodlot, they're going to be able to find a lot of insects. But when you have a lot of big birds of prey, um, it's a challenge to for them to find enough to eat. So a lot of them may go days without eating anything. So they're trying to save energy as much as possible. And over land, they can ride updrafts from ridges or they can find thermals of rising air and just soar on those. But if they cross water, they have to keep flapping continuously. So I think that's a big part of it. So uh, on that similar topic, Ken, uh, of migrating long distances, uh, how do these migratory birds uh, adapt when they encounter a storm or a major change in winds? And is there some sort of maximum wind that they can't tolerate? Yeah, that's that's a good point. Um, the Well, most uh, birds will migrate when the winds are favorable. Um, the like a small bird, like a warbler migrating north at mid may fly overnight and then come down and spend several days uh, feeding and resting. And when it takes off again, it'll be um, a night when the wind direction is favorable for where it wants to go. And so they, you know, they try to avoid storms if they can. Um, with larger birds, uh, they're, they're able to power their way through. We actually know there were a couple of satellite tag whimbrels uh, which is a big kind of sandpiper that actually flew through hurricanes um, and made it out the other side and continued migrating, which is 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 uh, astounding. But yeah, they'll especially with the smaller birds, they'll they'll look for weather conditions that will help them get where they want to go. Hey, can another. Um, they asked, uh, someone asked, how long does the, the, the really long distance migrations take, like uh, like the white rumped sandpiper from Terra del Fuego all the way to the Arctic? Um, yeah, that's, uh, we don't really know in detail about some of those, uh, those birds. Um, the, some of our best information is on, this is something that Melanie will be really familiar with, the uh, bar-tail godwits migrating from Alaska to New Zealand. And some of those have been satellite tagged and they've made it as a continuous flight. And like, you know, flying for eight days, nine days, uh, just over the open water from Alaska to New Zealand. Um, most birds, uh, make, they make migrations in stages. And so uh, they may, <laughs> if they're not just crossing, um, you know, like crossing open ocean or something, uh, they'll, they'll take weeks to make it from uh, breeding grounds to wintering grounds or vice versa. So um, we're wondering whether these migration patterns have changed in response to climate change. That's a good point. Yeah, um, we know that um, we know that the, the timing of migration for some birds is changing. Uh, areas where there's uh, where there their long term uh, records. Uh, they, we know now that some birds are arriving oh, 10 days to two weeks earlier in spring than they used to. Um, the uh, birds that are 
flexible in their migrations like uh, cranes and tundra swans in the Midwest. Uh, they're now migrating later in fall and earlier in spring than they used to and not necessarily going as far south. Uh, the Eastern population of sandhill cranes used to um, fly all the way to Florida for the winter. A lot of them are now wintering in Tennessee and small numbers farther north than that. So, so there are those, um, those changes that are consistent with what they would, we'd expect in, in warmer, warmer conditions. And I'm, I'm sure that, um, I'm sure we'll see more changes in patterns. Um, and I think uh, the Audubon's Migratory Brood Initiative is going to be among the first programs to actually figure out what's happening with these changes in pattern. So you might have explained this, but it came up again uh, very recently in the questions. Uh, why do some birds migrate as groups while other birds are solitary migrants? That's a really, <laughs> really good question. Um, it, um, I, th I think it, it tends to, uh, it, it, it fits in with their overall pattern of social interaction so that um, the things like, uh, like some migratory shorebirds like uh, Dunlins, for example, they're in flocks pretty much all year except when they're breeding. And so they're, you have like flocks of sanderlings along the shore or flocks of Dunlins. So they're, they're wintering in flocks, they, they migrate in flocks. Others that, um, that tend to be more solitary, like solitary sandpiper, which, you know, if apparently it can read, it recognizes its own name. Um, solitary sandpipers, uh, migrate as individuals and they're, um, they, they're separated out as individuals on their, their wintering grounds as well. And I, I think that that general pattern is going to hold that um, the, I, I can't off the top of my head think of birds that are really solitary at most seasons and then migrate in big flocks. Um, aside from some of the birds of prey that just wind up Sort of being forced by conditions to be in the same, uh, the same areas, the same lake shores, the same ridges, and so on. Will you tell us more about how we know about these migration patterns, how they're discovered? And, and so the question was actually, what else do we use to track them other than banding? Wow. Um, yeah, that, that's another thing that would make for a, a good entire uh, hour. But yeah, banding is among the was among the first um, approaches. Um, we, uh, we know some general things about patterns from looking at radar pictures, from looking at weather radar overnight um, and then just seeing where the concentrations of birds are. For knowing where individual birds go, there are things like uh, light level geolocators. Uh, you can put that on a bird and it will record an entire year's worth of approximate locations, but then you have to catch the bird again to, uh, to read the data from it. Uh, there are satellite tags you can use on larger birds. There's a new system, a new program called MODIS, where you put this tiny MODIS tag on the bird. You can even use them on, uh, on large dragonflies and things like that. And this, this MODIS tag puts out this little ping. And if you have a tower there, if you have one of these MODIS towers that can read which individual has just gone past. And MODIS towers are being deployed in many parts of the world now. Um, started in Canada, but uh, there's, there's great data coming from that. But um, it's, yeah, the, this, this, uh, there are a lot of different approaches and I think we're going to learn amazing things going forward. We'll have time for uh, one more question um, and we'll let uh, Ken ask Ken confusingly. Um, but if we get to your uh, burning question and you still want it answered, um, um, please feel free to email us and we'll do our best to uh, get back to you. And There have been a lot of questions about the physiology of birds and how they're able to survive that long distance of flying. People are amazed that they can fly for more than 24 hours straight. Is there any simple way of explaining what, how, how their bodies are adapted for a three-day flight? Well, I can give sort of an oversimplified answer. Um, there's, um, 
if you're a, a human and you try to run for, you know, run a marathon or beyond, um, there are certain chemicals that build up in the muscles. Um, the, the fatigue builds up, you know, certain chemicals that make you feel the exhaustion. And so there's, there's like muscle failure that, that results. And um, birds are set up physiologically so that uh, their vascular system moves these, these waste products away from the key areas of the muscle uh, so that the muscle fatigue doesn't, um, um, it doesn't, doesn't build up as fast. And that's, um, uh, that's not a, that's not a good technical um, definition, but it's, it's related to that. Uh, something similar happens with the pronghorn. That's the only mammal I know of offhand, like the, the pronghorn quote unquote antelope from Western North America has got the capability of running for really extended periods, partly because uh, it doesn't have that, that buildup of, of chemicals of fatigue in the muscles, but it, it's along those lines. Um, so uh, I, I encourage people to read up on this. There's just everything about migratory birds is, is totally amazing. Well, thank, thank you, Ken Elkins and Melanie for um, helping facilitate the question and answers. Um, thanks to Deb for your excellent introduction earlier and to Ken Kaufman, of course, for a fascinating presentation. Ken, that was great. The feedback we're getting so far has been wonderful. So we hope to have you back again for another very informative webinar sometime in the future. So thank you. Okay, well, thank you so much. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk with you today. Great, and I just wanna pitch our next webinar will be on April 21st. Uh, Marshall Johnson will be on to, um, to discuss uh, bird-friendly ranching and behaviors and steps that we can take to uh, personally help birds thrive. So um, look for an invitation to come via email and um, hope you can join us next month as well. Thank you very much.